what he wanted from the men he picked up. I had uh, these obsessive uh, desires and, and uh, thoughts wanting to control them, to, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, possess them permanently. And that's why you killed them. Right, right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me. And uh, as my obsession grew, uh, I was saving body parts such as... The Scorpion and the Frog. Everybody knows their story, right? In a flood, a scorpion, unable to swim, asks the frog's help in crossing a river. The frog refuses, saying the scorpion will sting it, to which the scorpion reacts, How can I sting you? I will be on your back. If I sting you and you die, we both drown. The frog, finding the scorpion's reason valid, agrees, and taking the scorpion on its back, starts swimming to the other bank of the river. But in the middle of the river, the scorpion stings the frog. In its dying moments, while drowning, the frog asks, Why? Why did you sting me? You killed us both. The scorpion replied, I guess it's in my nature to sting. Nature, character, traits, alleles, genes. We know our genes code for almost all our traits. How we look, how our body works, how we metabolize our food, what allergies we have, what diseases we are susceptible to, so on and on. But what about our more intrinsic traits? Do our genes determine whether we are kind? Do they determine the kind of books we like to read? Movies we like to watch, songs we like to hear, our favorite ice cream flavor? Probably not. Or maybe not to a large extent. These are things that are determined by social conditioning, the kind of environment one grows up in. Just like whether someone is kind or not, helpful or not, selfless or selfish, etc, etc. So in short, most of our worth as human beings, of whether we are, to put it crudely, good or bad people, rests upon the choices we make, which in turn is conditioned by how we were brought up. But are there elements within this which are intrinsically inbuilt within us, buried deep under layers upon layers of evolution, deep within our genetic code? Can a person be born evil? If not, then can there be evil which is unjustifiable, which cannot be reasoned with? Can someone be evil for the sake of being evil? Nothing more, nothing less. The autopsy of Jane Doe is a tragic tale. That is the first thing you should know about this movie. From the very first frame of the movie, there is a there is a certain morose sadness which surrounds the way the story unfolds, the way the scenes are shot. There is a certain coldness to it, a certain joylessness. Well, given that the film is literally about an autopsy and the two central characters work in a morgue cutting open human corpses to ascertain how they died, well, said coldness is very much to be expected, right? Tommy Tilden and his son Austin Tilden own the Tilden Morgan Crematorium, where they perform autopsies for the local sheriff department. Grim is a part of their lives, seeing and doing the gruesome job of cutting open human corpses, most of whom were alive a few hours ago, surely would make most people flinch in horror and disgust. But the Tildens, as it is well established from the very beginning of the film, are very good and used to their jobs. Tommy Tilden, the experienced veteran, 
and Austin, the inexperienced student and son, trying his best under his father's strict tutelage, hoping to catch up to him one day. One case, one case changes it all. One day changes it all. One autopsy changes it all. An unidentified female's body is recovered from a crime scene and is sent to the Tildens for determination of the cause of death. The crime scene involved the murder of a couple at their home, along with the domestic hell, all three found dead. As such, who was this Jane Doe? How did her body reach there? How was she connected to the other three murders? Questions loomed, answers searched, theories crafted, and thus the Jane Doe's body was sent for autopsy. This is the basic introduction to the film. From here, the story weaves its way through the night of the autopsy, the mystery surrounding her, the events unfurled on that night, causes and their effects rippling through the initially quiet and silent, but then increasingly noisy, shaky, and violent night. The greatest strength of this movie is the mystery surrounding Jane Doe. From the moment Jane Doe is introduced on screen, the film almost never veers off her and the mystery surrounding her. Who is she? How did her body end up at the crime scene? How did her body, even upon thorough examination, revealed no external signs or marks of injury? And how, in sharp contrast to the external appearance, her internal organs were so badly damaged. Her lungs blackened as if by third degree burns, her ankles and wrists broken without any external signs of injury, her tongue cut off roughly, her tooth in her stomach, her eyes clouded as if she had been dead for a long time, yet no signs of rigor mortis, post-mortem lividity, no signs of decomposition pointing out a recent death. Contradicting points emerge. Evidences don't point towards what they should. And the night, as time passes, delves into a progressively confusing maze of puzzles, mysteries, and dangers. Tommy and Austin Tilden, men of science, resort to sacrificing logic at the altar of the truth to understand what exactly happened to Jane Doe and to save their own lives trapped in a hell of somewhat their own making. Imagine being trapped in a morgue with the human corpses who before that night were little more than causes of death, but now have evolved into sentient, vicious monsters roaming around the morgue, trying to stop the Tildens from completing the autopsy, the autopsy of Jane Doe. So now, if you still wish to watch this film beyond this point in the video, this is a good place to stop watching. Because now, we dive into the deep waters of major spoilers. So, who is Jane Doe? Well, we never find out. I mean, we do to some minor extent, but never in details. And that is another thing I really liked about this film. It never sacrifices the entirety of the mystery for the sake of exposition. The veil, sure, it is thinned, but still enough of it remains by the end of the film to warrant a damn that was good from me. Coming back to the story, as the Tildens progress through the autopsy, they begin to dawn upon the dangerously unique nature of their subject, the Jane Doe. The autopsy, the night, the storm outside, everything had come together culminated together, creating a deadly trap with the Tildens finding themselves being attacked by the other dead bodies in their morgue, reanimated somehow, out for their blood. Running, locking themselves up, brainstorming, Tommy and Austin arrive upon the fact that this was somehow all the doing of the Jane Doe, 
the same Jane Doe who by the way lay on their autopsy table with her chest and abdomen opened up, her internal organs out in a tray. Impossible. But nothing they had experienced throughout that night till then followed the bounds of logic or human reasoning. Persevering through the horrors, the Tildens continue with the autopsy, only to conclude that the Jane Doe on their table was from nowhere around there, both in place and in time. From the cloth they found from her, along with all the other violent signs of internal damage they had found in her, the Tildens concluded that the Jane Doe was from New England around the end of 17th century, a suspected witch allegedly practicing witchcraft, she was put to death by vicious torture, paralyzing her, forcing her to swallow her own tooth, her genitals mutilated, her hands and ankles broken, and then her body burnt. A really vicious end. And now, perhaps she wanted to punish the father and son for cutting open her body inflicting her with the same pain again. In a desperate bid to save his son, Tommy asks Jane Doe to take him and inflict as much pain as she wanted, exacting her revenge, but leave his son. She does that, killing Tommy, using the hurt and wounds inflicted on him to heal herself up, as if nothing happened to her body. A really tragic end, right? Except it isn't the end yet, as Jane Doe, after this, ends up killing Austin as well by making him fall from the stairs. Thus, Austin, his father Tommy, and also Austin's girlfriend Emma are all killed in the end by Jane Doe. This reminds me of another really interesting thing which I really liked in this movie. Throughout this entire ordeal, throughout everything that she did, caused deaths, the pain, the fear, throughout all the events of the night. Not once do we see Jane Doe move. She lays exactly in the same spot as she was in the beginning of the night, on the autopsy table. I had expected at least one shot where we see Jane Doe moving around, attacking, turning monstrous, etc. But the film never does that. And I'm not gonna lie, it felt really refreshing. It made the horror part much more surreal. So, why did the Jane Doe kill Austin, even after everything that Tommy did? It is made clear from what happened to the Tildens and the Douglases before them that this was a very clear killing spree. A spree of horror, terror, a trailblaze of evil. It was never about revenge, justice, writing the wrongs done to her centuries ago. It had been, and from the film's ending, likely will continue to be, a wildfire of evil, spreading and spreading, unnoticed by others, only to be endeared by the ones unfortunate enough to be caught in the Jane Doe's crosshair. So, hidden underneath the rubble of all that the film shows us, only one question emerges. Can pure evil be reasoned with? Can evil ever be truly just? If so, what is the source of this evil? Only societal wrongdoings and a bad unconducive environment which was unable to suckle the needs of a growing human being? Or is there something deep, something inherent within us, kept in check by our conditioning, our learning, our consciousness? Who knows? Who knows?